Hi guys, welcome back to Animal Wonders. I'm Jessie and this is Emily. I'm from the Brain Scoop. She came to visit us at Animal Wonders because we both kind of deal with animals and I wanted to share the animals with her because um, they're alive. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you know a lot about alive animals and I kind of know what they look like on the inside. So it's like marriage of, of two great worlds. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we do kind of similar things, but they're kind of on the opposite spectrums. Like we come at it a different way, a like different angle, I guess. Uh, I work really hard to establish an emotional connection with the animal, which I think is pretty easy with a live animal that's like being super cute or interesting in front of someone so they can make that emotional connection. How do you get like your audience, how do you get education to them? I guess the, my approach is kind of like, so you you do have that, like, the animal is alive and they can see how it moves and they have, like, this whole new appreciation for for different aspects of, like, behavior and, you know, how, how you have it. And, and so, like, that gives them a new appreciation. But I think looking at it kind of from my perspective, we have hundreds of thousands of animals and specimens in our collection and they were all just as unique and individual as the one that you show them and so i try to challenge the way people think about death and individuality when it comes to animals in order to get them to have more like real world uh application or connection with wildlife because if they just see the dead raccoon on the side of the road that could be just the same dead raccoon but that's representative of thousands of raccoons that are still living out in the wild and to think about like what kind of impact we're having on their environment. So I guess that's in a nutshell how I think about it. Yeah, no, I, I like that, um, that individuality, but then also I think it's really important for them to know that we know so much about our living specimens because of the dead specimenism that we have. Yeah, I mean, imagine a, trying to study parrots in the wild. Parrots fly, you know, so it's hard to track them. It's hard to really, uh, you can have observations made of them in nature, but then you also have to bring them to captivity. And in order to know more about that, you have to kind of know about their chemistry and what they eat and their diet. And so you have to know about the habitat in which they live. And mm -hmm. it's like, you can't feed bread to ducks because ducks don't get bread as part yeah. of their natural. And I just saw that link that you posted yes, today. And I was yes. like, good point. Yeah. Ducks can't bake bread. Yep. Feed them stuff that comes from, you know, that, like that kind seeds, of- Like right. seeds, whole foods. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, so that's super important when you have all of the specimens that we do in the museum, to look at them from a research perspective that we have the dead in order to learn more about the living, in yep. order to preserve the living. So yep. again, I think it complements each other really well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Plus I get to look at their insides. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> So we obviously both love animals and the natural world and studying it and sharing with other people, but we wouldn't know any of this if we didn't have science. Right. So I guess my big question is, how do we translate like excitement and passion and like say that is science? How do we get others excited about science? I think just being excited about science helps a lot. Um, I think there are a lot of misconceptions about what a scientist looks like and what is socially acceptable for a scientist to act. You know, yeah. like if you're too overexcited, you come off come like that as the crazy kind of frizzy haired yeah. old guy version. That's not accurate. <laughs> and so I think scientists, they, you know, they deserve to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. um, so then they approach it very seriously and that can have the negative uh, result of not being very engaging because it's like well, this is super serious so, like all fun stops when you start doing serious science and so I don't I don't really agree with that I think science no matter how complicated like it it deserves a moment for you to be like oh my god like wow yeah and I and so I like really go for those like wow moments the ways that you can uh, take a really complicated concept and distill it and make it like a really digestible narrative, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like turning scientific research into stories that people can like uh, incorporate in their everyday. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, we just need more of that. I think we need a lot, a lot more of that. We need more people like showing how exciting science is. And I mean, you're great at that. And uh, I get super excited about science too. too. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I get super excited. And um, I, I, I think we're getting there. I think we're getting there, but I mean, young kids, they they love animals mm -hmm. and they like doing experiments yeah. and they're really fun. 
And then as you get a little bit older, when you're going into high school, then science gets dry. Yeah. And I think we need more exciting people to, to be like, no, it's not just kids don't get excited about science. Like, adults get excited about science, too. Yeah. And it's, it's super fun. Science super is fun. super fun. And there's a lot of potential to make science more hands-on and engaging and to incorporate, like, the artistic side of science. Yeah. People seem to think that science is very very logical, very analytical, and very rigid. And that's not at all. Like science is one of the most creative ways to look at the world because you're taking something that comes to you as like an abstract and you're thinking about it in a creative, kind of imaginative way. And then science is just the the real world like answering to it with like data and research. And yeah. I think that's super exciting. I mean everything yeah. that we do is visual and colorful and it has movement and art and poetry of life and uh, I'm getting a little I'm getting crazy. I'm getting excited just yeah. listening to you <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> Emily's on the crazy train um but yeah and, and so I think you know that if we show how uh art is interwoven with science and science really complements art then mm -hmm. I think it'll be a lot more engaging for young people to to stay in the field more yeah, yeah. And it's not just for guys, right? No, science is not just for guys. Uh, <laughs> that's something that we struggle with. I think, honestly, what it comes down to is like offering not a lot of, as, as the United States, we don't offer a lot of like parental leave. Um, so yeah. when women are in the midst of pursuing their like high-level academic careers, they also want to have families. Mm -hmm. And we don't really offer them any way to have both right now. And so yeah. I think that's something that needs to change. Yeah, I agree. So you were talking about like making things into a story and then having hard data behind it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the hard data, you could call that a little bit dry, mm -hmm. but if we didn't have the hard data, then we wouldn't be able to do the story making stuff. Absolutely. Like yeah. I wouldn't be able to know the nutritional values of all the different kinds of foods that I give. We wouldn't be able to make like, like all these diets that are behind you. Yeah. Those are like hard science, hard, hard data, making those so that we can then get creative as well so it's a, it's a combination right. of the the data and the exciting creative part yeah you know I so I've been reading this book by E.O. Wilson and it's called letters to a young scientist and everybody should read it everybody should read it I don't care if you're gonna be a scientist or not this book is amazing and that I mean E.O. Wilson is one of the world's greatest scientists of our age and he talks about how like he is as much a poet as he is a scientist and a researcher because when he has a question about the world it's because he's imagining things in a bigger picture sort of way and he studies ants and so he will do basic experiments that start off as a narrative you know he'll look at two ant colonies and he'll be like these are different species of ants I wonder what will happen if I take the queen out of this one and put it in this one and so he does it mm -hmm. and watches what happens and then he's like okay I got my science and from there it's like taking that information and putting it in graphs and like yeah. doing the timing and and letting the experiment run its course and recording it and like that doesn't I mean that doesn't have to be seen as dry that's that's you confirming like something some new discovery I think mm -hmm. that can be a mm -hmm. super exciting part of it and yeah. you don't have to be a math genius you don't have to be like naturally gifted at statistics I don't yeah. think there's anybody who's like naturally gifted it's not like you're I've met I've met a couple people but I'm not and but I still do it. It's still something you have to be taught and trained. It's just yes, like coloring. Exactly. Exactly. You know, like, so I graduated with an art degree. I studied painting. I essentially have <laughs> a professional degree in colors. Um, but, like, everybody colors when they're a kid. And if you just do it and practice it enough, you can be good at it. Yeah. And it's the same thing with math. It's the same thing with physics. And the great thing is when you get out of, like, uh, you know, you, you get to a certain level of your academic career, you can collaborate people who can compensate where you aren't yes. as talented. Exactly. So it's not that scary. It Just isn't. make friends with some math people. So you're talking about how everyone starts coloring as a kid, but that you worked really hard and you honed those skills to become, you know, a, almost an expert, right? A professional at that, mm -hmm. right? So that's what everyone has to do. You can't know everything. I mean, there, you just can't know everything. You can always, there's more to learn. But what people do is you become a specialist in something. So I'm really good at animal behavior, mm -hmm. but I don't know physics that well. I don't know math that well. So then you get experts that have gone into those fields and you all collaborate and you help each other out. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what's exciting about it. You don't have to be intimidated by science because you just find the one thing that you're really interested in and become good at that. Yeah. And then and other people take care of you know the other portions of it and you have to find your own niche 
yeah. your own like creativity and say like what is the unique perspective that I have to offer to this field as yes. a whole and there are so many things about science to pursue like just the word I, I mean it's just like a it's it's a loaded word so it's it's pretty easy for us to talk about what we do and get super excited about science because that's what our lives are all about and that's what we've dedicated our lives to we get really specific and we we focus on just our little portion of science and i think showing that to others is yeah. a really good way to be like look we're excited about what we do and you can find what you're passionate about and be excited about what you do too yeah i mean being a good communicator is half the battle if not most of the battle um, I think it's just finding people who are excited about what is it they study and who are good at talking about it. Mm -hmm. And we need more people like that. Yeah. Um, because literally any subject can be interesting if you have somebody like that talking about it. That's true. Like, I have sat riveted through a lecture about land snails. This has been exciting. Yeah, it's super exciting. I'm super happy you invited me to come on. Yeah, thanks. thanks for coming. Yeah. So I couldn't do an episode without an animal, so I brought Cheeks out because he is adorable. And yeah. I thought Emily would like to feed him a banana. Yeah, I do. Please, there you go, Cheeks. <laughs> dom, 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 dom. <laughs> dom, dom, dom. Whoa. <laughs> You can eat the whole thing? I, I just love his little face, his little cheeks. Well, thank you for having me on the show. <laughs> Thanks for coming. This was really fun. Yeah. Thanks for feeding the rabbit. Yeah. Talking to me about awesome things. <laughs> How could you not love this guy? This is great. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys for watching. If you'd like to go on an adventure with us every week, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, Animal Wonders Montana. Oh. <laughs> Or you can follow me on Twitter, Tumblr, and Facebook if you have any questions or comments or like to say hi to Emily, leave them in the comment section below. Thanks, guys. Hi, guys. Welcome to Animal Wonders. I'm Jessie, and we have some announcements to make. Whoa! Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs>